I swear, kids these days don't know anything about real music. Welcome to Module 7, Lecture 18 for Introduction to International Relations. In this lecture, we're going to cover monetary relations. So, money. Everyone's familiar with this subject, but money as a concept has evolved over time. One really interesting example of this is the ray stone uh, used by the Yap people. And this is a very primitive form of exchange where this jar giant stone which is made out of limestone, would be used to uh, compensate someone for goods or services provided. And another interesting thing about this is obviously it is incredibly large, so moving it isn't very convenient or efficient. And so the way in which people understand exchanges that go on is that the person who receives the stone may then pass it on to someone else, but it won't leave, say, their front yard, and they just remember this through oral histories. But as you can tell, in a very complex and modern world, this probably wouldn't be the most efficient source of exchange as far as monetary relations are concerned. Then later, we had the use of uh, precious metals, which could oftentimes be heavy, but were rare and uh, would be used because of their brilliance and because they had some kind of value based on the scarcity or the difficulty in obtaining them the quality, the purity, so, uh, but it's also perhaps not as uh, useful when we want to do ba basic interactions over the course of a day, like buying groceries or going to the movies or something like that. Carrying around gold doubloons or uh, bricks of gold is probably not going to be the easiest thing to manage. So then we had a more recent innovation, uh, which is the cloth or paper money. And this is a lot more portable, um, but one difference is that the value that's imputed, as we talked about in the lecture on constructivism, is a function of the faith that people have in that particular uh, form of currency. So if tomorrow everyone were to think that a United States currency is worthless and they're not going to invest in the United States and they're not going to accept uh, U.S. dollars, then the value would be potentially depreciated. So uh, it's, we've moved over time from different conceptions of the way in which we use money. Uh, and even now we have things like bitcoins um, and you know, Apple Pay and uh, things like that where we are no longer even using tangible cloth or paper money, but we're using our cell phones that are linked to credit accounts and then we perform exchanges for goods and services that way. Now we're going to talk about international currency exchange. Today, national currencies are valued against each other, not against precious metals. So we use exchange rates to compare the value of these different currencies. Relative values at any given point in time are arbitrary. Only the changes in values over time are meaningful. So there's a couple of different kinds of currency. There's non-convertible currency, which is money that cannot be traded for another currency. And then there's hard currency. And this is money that can be readily converted to leading world currencies. So to give you an example, I did some of my dissertation research in Nepal. And every single day that I was there, uh, there was a little vendor outside of my hotel that had the day's exchange rate between the Nepali rupee and the U.S. dollar. And every day that I was there, the exchange rate got worse in favor of the Nepali rupee, which means that even though I had the same amount of money that I came to the country with, it could buy me less and less goods in that country the longer that I stayed there. And when I came back, I entered the United States through Los Angeles, and I had, I don't know, maybe $20, $30 worth of Nepali rupees, uh, and I decided I want to exchange them for U.S. dollars. But because the Nepali rupee is not a very common currency, once I got to the airport, they told me they simply don't accept it. And that's a very kind of foreign concept, right? We use U.S. dollars, and if you travel abroad, you've had experiences perhaps using other forms of currency. But it's kind of a shock to the system 
to go to another or your home country where they have a hard currency that is readily exchangeable with lots of other world currencies and you want to exchange something and the uh, currency exchange office says we simply don't accept that kind of money. So then the only real alternative you have is perhaps to go to a bank and hope that they're going to be willing to exchange it or to go back or sell it to someone else who's going to Nepal. So there are these different kinds of currencies and they're, they're differently able to be converted to other kinds of currencies which means that they may be more or less useful. So let's look at an example of why the exchange rate might be important and how it fluctuates over time. So this is from just over about a year ago, uh, a year-to-year -year capture in time of the value of the euro dollar versus the US dollar. And as you can see, the value has fluctuated somewhat considerably from the early part of 20 or the end of 2014, and then it grew steadily uh, over the course of 2015. What I want to highlight here is on the y-axis. So you have the relative value of the euro dollar compared to the US dollar. And as you can see, that at around, say, March of 2015, uh, the euro dollar, you were getting about 0.95 euro dollars for every one US dollar. So that means that the US dollar is actually worth less compared to the euro dollar. Uh, if, the threat, if it were to have crossed the threshold over the one-to-one -one ratio, that would mean that you're getting more euros for every US dollar, which means that the US dollar is stronger. So here we can see that what was important if you are going to, say, have a you know, trip to Europe over spring break, you'd want to know what that value is at that moment because that's when you're going to be there and that's when you're going to be interacting with another culture's currency and it will de determine the amount of money that you're going to be able to use there. So let's a little talk a little bit about exchange rates. There are several different kinds. There's fixed exchange rates, which is where the government establishes official rates of exchange that do not fluctuate. Then there are floating exchange rates, and these are rates determined by global currency markets in which private investors and governments readily buy and sell different currencies. And then there's also a kind of hybrid system called a managed float system. And this is where governments work together to intervene and exert some control over otherwise free-floating currencies. This is a costly action that liberals, in particular from international relations, will use as evidence that states cooperate when it suits their long-term interests. So, now we get to a really important question. Why is it that currency values go up or down? Why do they rise and fall? So, there are a few reasons. One is the supply, or the amount of money uh, a government prints. Another is the other side of the coin, demand. It depends on the state's economic health and political stability. So if a currency has a low value, there are certain benefits and drawbacks associated with that. One of the benefits is that it could promote exports because your value of your goods will be cheaper for other countries to purchase, which could lead to a trade surplus, right? And we know that the balance of trade formula is the number of exports minus the amount of imports. So if you're exporting more than you are importing, you're going to have a trade surplus. A drawback is that you will have low purchasing power. So if your currency is worth less and you go over to Europe and say you want to use it in Germany, the United States dollar over in Germany, then you will be able to purchase less because the value of your currency relative to, say, the euro dollar is now diminished. What about if your currency has a high value? Uh, here, a benefit of that would be that it promotes imports. So you're getting a lot more from other countries because they're able to sell in your country, and that can lead to things like greater consumer choice and competition, and also leads to high purchasing power. So when you go over to another country where you have a higher currency value relative to the other currency of that country, then it means you can purchase more with your money. But a drawback of this is that it encourages a trade deficit because it's likely that your imports will be larger than your exports. So that leaves us with a negative number, therefore it encourages a trade deficit. And values adjust automatically toward achieving, remember, equilibrium. But states can correct overvalued currency by printing more money 
or they can devalue their own currency. And we'll talk a little bit more about an example of that uh, very soon. So international financial institutions, what do they do? How are they helpful? We're going to talk about that in a later lecture, but for now we're just going to give you a general overview. So from roughly the end of the, of the world, Second World War up through 1971, we had the Bretton Woods system. And this was adopted in 1944 and established a couple of really key institutions. The International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which is also known as the World Bank. Um, it also provided loans to help Western European countries rebuild their economies after World War II. And it set up a stable system of exchange in which world currencies were pegged to the U.S. dollar, and the U.S. dollar was then pegged to the price of gold. We have the International Monetary Fund, which coordinates international currency exchanges, balance of international payments, and national accounts that countries hold. Uh, although this is a, not quite a new currency in, in the sense that you can purchase it and then use it at an, in another country, um, we have what are called special drawing rights. And this is a kind of uh, foreign exchange reserve that is managed by the International Monetary Fund. And what we have are a basket of different currencies that together uh, constitute these special drawing rights. Uh, these are what countries can, can purchase, but not individuals or private actors. And what was really interesting that happened last summer is that China unilaterally decided to devalue its own currency several times over the course of a couple weeks, and it sent absolute shockwaves through the international system. Uh, global markets were plummeting, um, but this was a very calculated and strategic move on the behalf of China to get its currency down to a level that was probably more in line with what its actual value might be. And they were rewarded for this action, even though it led to uh, a huge negative impact in global markets, uh, stock markets, uh, for parts of the summer. The Chinese yuan was then added to special drawing rights. And it is now, in terms of the weighting, all these different currencies that are in this basket are weighted differently. And for their actions, the Chinese yuan is now weighted more heavily than both the Japanese yen and the British pound. Let's talk a little bit about debt, something that probably most of you are familiar with, but we're going to talk about this at the international level. So why would you borrow money if you're a country? Well, you want to increase your wealth using funds you don't have. You borrow money at a certain interest rate, and you hope that you make enough to pay back more than that interest rate. And so you have the real interest rate, which is the annual interest rate minus the inflation rate, because right, the value of, of money goes up and down. So it may inflate over time, and that affects what you're actually paying in terms of your real interest rate. So why do countries go into debt? We certainly know why people do. Well, they run a trade deficit, right? They are importing more than they're exporting. Um, individuals and households and businesses simply spend more than they make. Um, Governments may do this, right? They may spend more than they're able to recoup from taxation. And we have two different kinds of policy that are really important to distinguish between. You've got fiscal policy, which refers to government decisions about spending and taxation. And then you've got monetary policy, which, is, which refers to decisions about printing and circulating money. So one really kind of easy way to think of the difference is monetary policy deals with money, right? Actual money. So let's take a look for a moment about how the United States compares to other countries, uh, mostly developed countries, uh, in, this is from 2014, in their trade balance, right? Which is this balance of, of trade, exports minus imports. And so what you can see is that imports are denoted by a little circle and the exports are noted by uh, a triangle. And so the United States has uh, the largest amount of trade but at the same time, it has a huge trade deficit when you compare what we're importing to what it is that we are exporting to the rest of the world. Uh, let's talk for a moment about multinational businesses because as we talked about in several lectures ago, um, these are increasingly important actors in their own right in international relations. And in particular, we can look at what are called multinational corporations or MNCs. These are companies that are based in one state, but they have affiliated branches or subsidiaries that are operating in other states. Examples of these might include industrial corporations that we've probably all heard of, 
Honda, Samsung, Apple, Shell, uh, financial companies, Visa, Citigroup, UBS, Allianz, ING. Agents of home governments, if we're taking a kind of mercantilist approach, um, are what these multinational corporations might be considered. Or if you're taking a Marxist approach, governments might be the agents of the multinational corporations. Or is it possible that MNCs are citizens of the world simply operating independently of any home state? They're not beholden to any country. And as I alluded to in the previous lecture where we talked about Facebook, many of these companies are more powerful than even small states. So it's really important that we pay attention to what they do because they may have an influence that is outside the pale of what can be achieved by some of these smaller countries that wield less influence in the international system. So what Facebook wants to do, what uh, BP Oil wants to do, may have a greater impact on the international economy or the decisions and behaviors of other states than, say, small island developing states like Kiribati. Finally, let's conclude by talking a little bit about foreign direct investment. FDI is the acquisition by residents of one country of control over a new or existing business in another country. It involves long-term arrangements uh, involving tangible goods like factories and office buildings. So as a kind of concrete example of this, foreign direct investment might be Coca-Cola decides to set up a brand new bottling plant in Zimbabwe. So they build a factory, they build homes for the workers that are going to be there, and that becomes the foreign direct investment that they are providing in that country, perhaps because they think it would be more economically efficient for distribution throughout parts of Africa. Most FDI takes place between industrialized countries, but on an increasing basis, we have South-South flows, and in particular, China has recently become the largest donor supplanting the World Bank to other developing countries. Mercantilists view foreign direct investment in their own country with suspicion, uh, right, because of the potential intentions that other countries might have with respect to how they would use that to strengthen their military. But liberals, on the other hand, favor FDI because it promotes global efficiency. What do you think about Marxists? Uh, if we take the Marxist view, have, we have to consider the fact that they would probably be also suspicious, but for different reasons than the mercantilists, because they might view it as uh, the Western com uh, companies that are encroaching upon the territory of developing states, and they are doing so so that they can recolonize uh, those former colonies and that this is simply adding to the global phenomenon of exploitation between the wealthy countries and the poorer countries.